following is a special presentation of HBO Sports. Again, they watch, wanting more than anyone can reasonably expect. Time is about to run out. Defeat is near, an ugly shadow. Someone has to seize the moment. Someone whose magnificence will become frozen in time. Jordan! Michael Jordan! And now, Doug Flutie is down to his last at bat. We have a big 3-2 pitch coming here from Eckersley. Gibson swings. These rare displays we savor. It is a team playing beyond reason and beyond words. Little roller up along first. Sometimes, Behind the it is not a grand gesture we celebrate, but a grand mistake. Let's win it! He may do it! Yeah, he may! And through the ages, oh, how we have raced just to be first to the finish line. He may do it! Yeah, he may! He's that close! Look at It is when all the best laid plans have gone awry, when all else has failed. This is when we look again for last second miracles. Vince Lombardi's 1967 Green Bay Packers were trying to do what had never been done before, win a third straight NFL championship. They faced two formidable obstacles, Tom Landry's brash, young Dallas Cowboys and the piercing chill of minus 15 degree temperatures. The Packers jumped out to an early 14 to nothing lead, but then they stalled. The Cowboys, meanwhile, made their charge and went ahead 17 to 14. With time enough for one last drive, the Green Bay offense somehow finds itself, marching 63 yards within inches of the Dallas goal line. Vince Lombardi's Packers have 16 seconds to win an unprecedented third straight title. Quarterback Bart Starr and Lombardi decide to gamble with no timeouts left and go for the victory rather than settle for a field goal and sudden death overtime. To Vader, 17 to 14, Cowboys out in front. Packers trying for the go-ahead score. Starr begins the count, takes the snap. He's got the quarterback sneak and he's into the touchdown and the Packers are out in front. 20 to 17, there's 14 seconds showing on the clock and the Green Bay Packers are going to be world champions, NFL champions for the third straight year. Two weeks later, the Packers won their second straight Super Bowl, Vince Lombardi's last game as coach of Green Bay. In spite of a serious birth defect, Tom Dempsey played in the NFL for eight seasons, but he will always be remembered for this game in 1970. The Saints were trailing the Lions by one point with only two seconds left, when Dempsey lined up for what seemed an impossible 63-yard field goal. Try to kick the longest field goal in National League history. Here's a snap, the ball is down, Dempsey kicks, it's on the way! It was the longest field goal in the NFL. The 1975 Dallas Cowboys stood at the edge of elimination from the playoffs against the Minnesota Vikings. Trailing 14-10, Dallas was huddled 85 long yards away from victory. Just two minutes remained. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle, as we said. Roger Staubach hits Drew Pearson for completions of 9, 7, and 25 yards. But the Cowboys are still 50 yards shy of the end zone. It seems only a miracle can save them. Good thing for the Cowboys. Pearson knows miracles. Again, Staubach has him in the shotgun formation. Roger takes the snap. Bumps it once. He's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five. Touchdown! Pearson goes in for the touchdown. And the Cowboys score as Staubach hit Pearson on a 50-yard touchdown. And the Cowboys lead with 24 seconds left. Would you believe it? 
The Vikings are claiming offensive pass interference, but no flag was thrown. And Pearson throws the ball over the scoreboard. Six years later, January 1982, it's the NFC Championship at Candlestick Park. The Cowboys are still atop the NFL's pedestal, and they're playing the San Francisco 49ers, suddenly contenders after years of mediocrity. But when Danny White passes to Doug Cosby for the go-ahead Cowboys score, the 49ers seem headed for the disappointing finish they have seen so many times before. San Francisco lines up for one more drive, one more chance. We're on the 11-yard line with uh, four minutes and 54 seconds to go, I think. And we had to go the length of the field. And we'd had six turnovers that day. So it, it didn't look good. But uh, you know, no, nobody ever gave up hope. You know, 89 yards away from Payton against America's team. I remember thinking, you know, this is going to be really hard to do. I didn't think it was impossible, but we kept going down the field. And you know, about halfway down there, I could hardly breathe. Everybody was so tired. And I guess you know, they were getting as tired as we were. San Francisco stops the clock with 58 seconds left. And Joe Montana calls sprint right option, a pass play against the exhausted doomsday defense. Right looking to throw. Looking to throw, and he throws into the end zone. Touchdown! Touchdown! Touchdown, San Francisco! It was exactly how it had been drawn up. It was thrown ex exactly in the right place, exactly where Bill told Joe to throw it. And if I hadn't got it, it would, it would have gone out of bounds, and we would have had fourth down and three on the six-yard line. Clark's amazing grab would signal the changing of the NFL's guard. It sent the 49ers to the Super Bowl for the first time and marked the beginning of their long dominance. Under Tom Landry, the Cowboys never made it to the Super Bowl again. Hands rather to his chest, and he didn't miss that one. Bratton to the end zone. It is 1984. And the Miami Hurricanes have taken a 45 to 41 lead over the Boston College Eagles. It was already a day to remember. But for a cast that included Miami coach Jimmy Johnson, quarterback Bernie Kosar, and Doug Flutie, this drama had not yet peaked. The winner of this regular season finale was to advance to the Fiesta Bowl and play for the national championship. Kozar and Flutie had thrown for more than 900 yards combined, and the lead had changed hands again and again. With only seconds left, BC took possession facing two alternatives, score a touchdown to win the game, Flutie or fail and lose. They'll get the clock stopped at 20 seconds. Flutie gets it out of bounds, across midfield. 12 seconds, and Doug Flutie is within 48 yards. He's got time, incomplete. And now, Doug Flutie is down to his last at bat. Flutie flushed, throws it down. Caught by Boston College, I don't believe it! It's a touchdown! The Eagles win it! He threw it into the end zone. There was no time left on the clock. All year long, I became a believer that, uh, that games are decided in the fourth quarter. Perhaps the biggest football miracle of all happened in 1972, a landmark year for the Pittsburgh Steelers. That season, true to his philosophy, Franco Harris helped decide several games in the final period. But in the playoff game between the Steelers and the Raiders, Oakland was the team working miracles in the last seconds. Kenny Stabler, who is really not known for his running ability, scrambled 30-something yards for a touchdown right at the end of the game. And I mean, I could not believe that. That was really disheartening, because I guess that's the sort of thing that we expected to happen. Suddenly, Pittsburgh trailed the Raiders 7-6. On fourth down and 10, the Steelers were seconds away from their season's end. But Franco Harris was a fourth quarter player. I went into the huddle telling myself, Franco, it's been an interesting year. This will probably be your last play. 
play it to the end. 22 seconds remaining. And this crowd is standing. Seeing their team go behind by one point. And Bradshaw back and looking again. Bradshaw running out of the pocket. Looking for somebody to throw to. Fires it downfield. And there's a collision. And that, that's cut out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Frank O'Hare. Raiders claimed the ball was illegally touched by two Steelers and that it hit the ground before Harris scooped it up. But their protests were in vain. There's a couple of different uh, controversies surrounding that play and as I always mention, I, I have no comment. The 1941 World Series, scene of one of baseball's most memorable last second goofs. The Dodgers faced the favored Yankees, who were blessed when a sure-handed catcher lost his magic touch. The Yankees were really a dynasty back in those days. They had some of the greatest ball players in the history of the game, and they had them playing in their prime at the same time. And, of course, the Dodgers were on the uh, rise. At that time, they brought in some uh, good ball players and developed some good young ball players of their own. In game four, the Dodgers take a 4-3 lead into the ninth. The first two Yankees are retired easily, and the Dodgers are one out away from tying the series at 2-2. Dodgers reliever Hugh Casey pitches to the Yankees' Tommy Henrik. The count reaches three balls and two strikes. Dodgers are leading by a score of 4-3. to three. They're two out, nobody on base. Casey goes into the windup, around comes the right arm, in comes the pitch, it's way in. If I could have caught it, I wish I'd have caught it in my teeth, if, if I could have, but uh, I didn't miss many like that. I, I really, uh, I, I, I couldn't believe it wasn't in my mitt. Following the passed ball, the Yankees went on to score four runs, winning 7-4. Instead of tying the series, the Dodgers were behind three games to one and reduced to a state of shock. The very next day, the Yankees won the 1941 World Series four games to one. Giraldi brings it into Hernandez, and a fly ball to center field will be the second out. Shea Stadium, New York. The 1986 World Series appeared to be over. Game six, the bottom of the 10th inning. The Red Sox were ahead 5-3, one out away from their first World Series title since 1918. The Mets needed a miracle. I don't think anyone could imagine what was going to happen. I, I think when it happened, it, it just shocked everyone. There's a line drive in the left, and that's a hit. Carter gets a base hit in the left with two out, and it's not over yet. Breaking ball, base hit, center field. The tying runs are on. Here's the pitch from Chiraldi, and a swing and a base hit to center field. Makes it a one-run game. The tying run goes on to third. It's five to four with the tying run on it. Third base, the winning run on it. First base and two men out. A couple of guys were out of uniform and they already had a beer in hand. They had to run and put the uniform back on to get the dugout once we got this tied run on base. A long one could win it. The home run would win it. The pitch. Ball three. Wild pitch. We're going to be tied. The ball went off the glove of the catcher. We're five five in the bottom of the tenth. You gotta understand that the pressure was already off me before I hit the ball. The game was already tied. When I came to the plate, we were down a run, and now it's 3-2 and the game is tied. I just gotta make contact. Here's the pitch to Mookie Wilson. Winning run at second. Ground ball to first. It is a run, an error! An error by Buckner. The winning run scores. The Mets win at 6-5 with three in the tip. I don't feel sorry for Bill Buckner. And I don't think Bill Buckner wants it. I want to feel sorry for him. But um, if I had to say either he catched the ball and tags me out or whatever, or him missing the ball, I'm glad he missed it, you know, because I got to be a hero. There's no fight worth a man's life. This is one of the most unusual calls by a referee in the whole history of the sport. There's no doubt that Richard did the right thing. The man could have been seriously hurt. The winner and now holder of both the WBC and IBF 140-pound championships. Wherever they go, 
boxer and trainer will never be far from March 17, 1990, the night when trainer Lou Duva and boxer Meldrick Taylor were only moments away from the sweetest triumph of their lives. Las Vegas, Taylor, though undefeated, was the underdog. That's because Julio Cesar Chavez, 68-0, was regarded by many as the world's best boxer. I knew that I had to take my game to a, another level in order to beat him. I knew that I had to be 110 percent, and I knew that I had to give my best performance in my life. Taylor did. For 11 rounds, he was incessant, humbling Chavez. Solid left hand by Meldrick Taylor. Entering round 12, two of the three judges had Taylor comfortably ahead. By simply avoiding Chavez, the bout would be his. But Duva wouldn't let Taylor run. He told his boxer to fight. This is the last and final round. You want to be champion of the world? My instructions to him was stay low, turn this guy around, but win the round. He did that for 11 rounds, he did that for. Why shouldn't he do it the 12th round? Duva's instructions allowed Chavez the opportunity for a last-second miracle. If he gets up, he probably wins the fight. I can't believe Unbelievable. it! Unbelievable! Richard Un Steele stopped the fight with fewer than five seconds to go. You're gonna watch Lou Duva go absolutely berserk. When my fighters are true champions. They go out there to win the fight. I send them out there to win the fight. If I had to do it again, I'd do it. If I had to do it all over again, I would use my own judgment. I would do what my body was able to do in that last round. Clock begins to run again. It's down to 18. Memorial Stadium, Berkeley, California. Time was running out. But in the 85th meeting of Stanford and Cal, the best was yet to come. Senior John Elway, already a miracle worker, leads Stanford to the Cal 18, where kicker Mark Harmon appears to assure a victory. Listen to the crowd. Here's the snap. Here's the kick. It is long enough. It is good. Stanford hits it with four seconds to go and takes the lead, 20 to 19. Only a miracle can save the Bears. Four seconds remained. The sun was sinking behind Strawberry Canyon, and it seemed the day had already seen enough drama. And while Stanford celebrated, many Cal fans turned toward the exits, not knowing they would miss the chance to witness what was undoubtedly a last-second miracle. Harmon will probably try to squib it, and he does. Ball comes loose, and the Bears have to get out of bounds. Rodgers along the sideline, another one. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of... The ball is still loose as they get it to Rodgers. They give it back now to the 30. They're down to the 20. All oh, the band is out on the field. He's going to go into the end zone. He's going into the end zone. Will it count? The Bears have scored, but the bands are out on the field. Something had to be wrong with a play that had four players throwing five laterals. That had illegal players from both teams on the field that had the Stanford band forming a protective tunnel as the winning touchdown was scored. Although it seemed nothing was right about the play, in the end, it turned out nothing was really wrong. Everybody's milling around on the field! The Bears! The Bears have won! The Bears have won! Oh my God! The most amazing, sensational, dramatic, heart-rending, Exciting, thrilling finish in the history of college football. California <laughs> won the big game over Stanford. The Polo Grounds in Manhattan, 1951. The New York Giants and Brooklyn Dodgers, furious crosstown rivals, met for the final game of their pennant playoff. Dodger ace Ralph Branca took over for an exhausted Don Newcomb just two outs away from a one-run victory. But Branca was tired, too. People forget that Ralph Branca not only relieved on Sunday, he also relieved Saturday 
relieved Sunday, pitched two innings, pitched Monday and went eight innings, had Tuesday off, and I was back in the bullpen to pitch on Wednesday. People forget that. Something people will never forget is what happened next when Bobby Thompson stepped up to the plate. Nine years later, the New York Yankees met the Pittsburgh Pirates in the 1960 World Series. Through six games, the Bronx Bombers outscored Pittsburgh 46 to 17, but the scrappy Pirates had managed to eke out three wins. And after eight innings of game seven, Pittsburgh held a nine to seven lead, just an inning away from the championship. When we got the two runs ahead going into the, the top of the ninth, I uh, figured that we got to just, just show up and get three outs and we're out of here with the world championship. But uh, next thing you know, something happens. Here's a man on here, a base hit up the middle. And then Yogi hits a little looping liner with man on first and the runner walks in from third and ties the ball game. My heart just sank. I says, oh no, here come them Yankees. Here comes the Yankees back with uh, their favorites, you know, come from behind, win, and this and that kind of stuff. And I just figured we're just about out of it. I was about as low as I could get after being as high as you could get in the eighth inning. As the leadoff batter in the bottom of the ninth, Bill Mazeroski was about to try and do what had never been done before, win a World Series with a home run. Art Dittmar throws. Here's a swing and a high fly ball going deep to left. Let's do it. Back to the wall goes Barry. Ladies and gentlemen, Mazeroski has hit a 1-0 pitch over the left field fence at Ford Field to win the 1960 World Series for the Pittsburgh Pirates by a score. I couldn't help myself. I had to start jumping and yelling. I think I floated all the way around from second base to home plate. All I could think about was we beat the Yankees. We beat the great Yankees. We beat the Yankees. Mazeroski and Bobby Thompson won a World Series and a pennant for their teams with dramatic home runs. In 1975, the Boston Red Sox lost the World Series to the Cincinnati Reds in seven games. Yet, what we remember is game six, the at-bat by Red Sox catcher Carlton Fisk in the bottom of the 12th inning. And the wind blowing out. We've had three homers tonight, all the right field or right or center field. Carbos was to dead center, the other two to right. We will have a seventh game in this 1975 World Series. Carlton Fisk becomes the first player in the series to hit one over the wall into the net. Red Sox win it 7-6 to six in 12 innings. He took one step, knew it was going to be close. He knew it was gone, and it was dancing in the streets all the way around. And Carlton Fisk had a lot of little boy in him right there, Joe. Well, I was next to Sosh in the dugout during the whole thing, and I said, do you know who's gonna pinch hit here? And he said, well, he's got Andy up there. I said, no, Gibby's gonna come out. And he goes, he can't hit, he can't play. No one in Dodger Stadium expected Kirk Gibson to play in game one of the 1988 World Series. Gibson wasn't even in the dugout. Forced to stay in the locker room out of uniform, his damaged knees wrapped in ice. But with the Dodgers down four to three, and two out in the bottom of the ninth inning, Gibson sent a clubhouse assistant to tell manager Tommy Lasorda he was ready to go. Something just clicked, and I just said, baloney, we'll see about that. And I went out, peeled my ice bags off right at the end. I just walked straight out, and I picked up the rosin bag, and I walked straight to the batter's box. I was ready. 
and I had programmed myself for this moment, and I knew it was my calling. I was ready for the confrontation, and um, um, my first swings were weak. It was, uh, uh, some have told me they were, they were afraid I was embarrassing myself. Oral Hershiser was one of those doubters. You look like a new fawn up there in the batter's box the first couple swings, you know, just no legs at all, and almost hoping Tommy would pinch hit for him in the middle to get bat. You know, get him out of there, he looked terrible. When I got to 3-2, I stepped out of the batter's box and made Eckersley step off the, the rubber. And I said to myself, if you get him 3-2 in a pressure game, partner, as sure as I'm standing here breathing, he's going to throw you a 3-2 backdoor slider. I said that to myself. I stepped back in. He threw me a 3-2 backdoor slider. 3-2 pitch coming here from Eckersley. Gibson swings and a fly ball to deep right field. This is going to be a home run. Unbelievable. A home run for Gibson. And the Tigers have won the game 5-4. I don't believe what I just saw. I don't believe what I just saw. Is this really happening, Bill? It is happening, and they've got to help him home. The third-base coach, uh, Joe Malfitano, had to give him a little push. And all the Dodgers are around home plate. At that particular moment, not one Dodger fan, not one person in L.A. was thinking about any problems. We were all happy. And that doesn't happen very often, so it has to be a special moment. Flutie flushed. Throws it down. It's a touchdown! <laughs> the Eagles win it! Unbelievable! I don't believe it! Phelan's at the bottom of that pile! Here we Bobby Orr, behind the net, the center, and Orr! This has been a presentation of HBO Sports, the network of champions.